Guillaume Lisbell here, host of the E-Commerce Wizards podcast, where I feature top leaders in e-commerce and business. Today's guest is Steve Chu, and I'm very excited actually to have Steve here on, on the podcast because I've listened to a few of his episodes on his own podcast from My Wife Quit Her Jobs, over 400 episodes in there. It, it's really good stuff that I really appreciate. Uh, I believe uh, we share um, several values. He, he doesn't know yet, but I, I know a little bit more uh-huh. because I listened to your episode. So today we're going to be talking about an e-commerce store going from, you know, going from brick and mortar to be a traditional merchant and going online because there's no guarantee of success whatsoever with this process. It's just too common, unfortunately, that you start an online store, you list your products, and that thing just doesn't go anywhere. I've seen it too many times. And I've seen other stores, of course, going from zero to seven figures in a matter of a few years and a few more years going all the way to eight figures. So it's a topic that's really, really worth talking about that transition from brick and mortar to online and how do you make this a success because it's not guaranteed. So before we get started, we have a sponsorship message. This episode is brought to you by Mage Montreal. If a business wants a powerful e-commerce online store that will increase their sales or to move piled up dormant inventory to free up cash reserves or to automate business processes to gain efficiency and reduce human processing errors, our company, Mage Montreal, can do that. We've been helping e-commerce store for over a decade. Here's the catch. We're specialized and only work on the Adobe Magento platform. We do everything Magento related. If you know someone who needs design, development, maintenance, training, support, we got their back. Email our team support at Mage Montreal or go to magemontreal.com. That's M-A-G-E Montreal.com. All right, Steve, thank you for being here today. Glad to be here. I'm just going to say that if you are on Magento, you're going to need help. So you're going to need Mage Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I worked with Magento before. It's complicated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's made more for the mid-sized market and, and the larger companies. And some people don't know that and make the mistake of buying a $99 team thinking it's for small businesses. It's not <laughs> at all. And, and, and Steve, can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we start? Yeah. Uh, so I got started in e-commerce way back in 2007. This is before like Shopify and big commerce were a huge thing. I think the, the biggest card at the time was Yahoo Merchant Stores. I don't know if you remember those. I um, do. But the reason why we started selling online is because uh, my wife wanted to quit her job when we had our first child. And I know you just delivered a child uh, five weeks ago. Yeah, second one. <laughs> so my wife just wanted to stay at home. She didn't want to work anymore. And we live in the Silicon Valley, very expensive place to live if you want to get a good house in a good school district. So we needed to look for other sources of income. And we decided to sell handkerchiefs online, which is kind of a random story in itself. But bottom line, we made six figures in our first year in profit, so she could quit her job. And then today, it's a seven-figure business. Uh, it's been growing in the double double digits and triple digits ever since then. Awesome. Congratulations. Uh, very nice success story. And definitely, if you take the time to read all of Steve's stuff on his website, he's a high-level subject matter expert. Uh, let me say that for everything e-commerce. So... But let's dive into it. You know, if you were just to ask a consultant on a high level, how do you go from brick and mortar to online? Uh, you know, they may tell you like, uh, do a Google ad campaign, do a Facebook ad campaign, and just like pray that it works. You know, so that's not good enough. <laughs> well, I, it's just a, there's a number of things. So I've worked with a lot of brick and mortar stores who want to go online, and I think their first instinct is to just throw up everything on a site and just let it go. If you already have a brick and mortar store that you've been working on for a very long time or you've run, chances are you have a customer list, right? Um, You have order and contact information. And again, for the people that have purchased from you in the past, if you have the information, the first thing I would do is I would see how many email addresses that I have. And then I would send them an email that says, hey, um, you know, we know you purchased us from us in the past, and we really appreciate your business. Would you like to receive offers via email? Because you didn't explicitly get their consent in the beginning. So that first email basically has to ask for their consent to send them further emails. But while you're doing so, it doesn't help to just give them a coupon at the same time. And basically take advantage and move those brick and mortar people over to your online store where you have their information, you can track them much more accurately. That's the first thing that I would do. Which is a very a great advice. And I've seen also some other special kind of uh, ways of building lists like this that uh, back when the days of the law passed uh, for the anti-spam and all that, company was doing like win with a friend kind of uh, uh, draw. 
So this way you refer a friend and you win with your friend. So either you or your friend win, you know, you both win. And then it just like snowballed their list of contacts this way. You know, you know what else I would do? I would take all their purchase history because you have that somewhere in a database hidden somewhere. And I would create a loyalty program and just automatically include all the purchases they've made in the past and say, hey, you've accumulated this number of points. You're eligible for something free. It, it can be something really cheap just to get them over online. And again, these are just different ways to get them to opt in. Um, so if they've already purchased from you, just uh, hopefully you have all that data somewhere. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. So let's, yeah. let's assume it's structured enough that you do. Uh, maybe if it's just like cash checkout, like the grocery store, there's no data. But let's, uh, let's hope that your type I, of- I would imagine these days, like I, I can't remember the last time <laughs> I used cash actually at um, any store. Before COVID yeah. at least. Yeah, for sure. That, yeah, that was for sure. Okay, so that's a good start. You have your list that solves to that list. They do a few tactics and try to be creative on on how to make that interesting and there's value for the people to come to your online store or that they accept at least solicitation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have very different laws of Canada versus U.S. Like in the U.S., it's an opt out system, so you're sort of quote unquote allowed to spam people and they have to opt out. <laughs> it's not exactly like that, but <laughs> yeah, uh, it's much more lax than like the EU. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And Canada has closer laws to EU that you must have express consent and all that. So it's very, very right. different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going to take that one step further. Once you had them on email, then I would try to get them on SMS also. Agreed. Uh, and again, they have to consent to that. But if you, here's what we do with our store. Um, the way we get people on SMS is we actually just give away something for free. And usually when we go to our vendor, so we sell linens at our store. We'll go to our vendor and we'll say, hey, do you have anything on clearance you know, that you just you, know, you might have excess stock on for really low prices? And we'll buy that just, for the, just to give those away for free. And it's, it's funny, like the perceived value of a free product is really high, even though it might cost you very little money. So for example, our freebie is a free handkerchief. We sell handkerchiefs. And it costs us 15 cents. But the perceived value of that handkerchief is like $10, right? And so we just say, hey, uh, text this word, you know, to this number and we'll give you a free handkerchief. And then again, instantly you have people on email and SMS. Excellent. That's really, really good advice and cost effective. Uh, I like that. Okay. Now, um, okay, so we're talking about brick and mortar over to online, right? Yeah. The other key to going online is you have to realize you're not going to have salespeople on the floor to help people, right? So traditionally in a brick and mortar store, you walk in, like a salesperson might, you know, if you have any questions, you ask the salesperson directly. And there's a lot of information that's conveyed in a, in a physical conversation at a brick and mortar store, which does not exist online. But if you've been running a brick and mortar store for quite some time now, you know what people's pain points are, right? When they buy certain merchandise, because you have had that. It's, it's much easier, actually, ironically, to go from brick and mortar to online because you've already had those conversations. You right? understand so, your customers. Right. You understand your customers already. So your life is a lot easier. The tricky part is taking all that information on all the products that you've sold over the years and putting that down in a concise manner on your online store. So it can't just be a listing of products. Uh, uh, let me give you an example. Let's say you sell children's clothing. And let's say you, I, I, because you just had a kid, I use this example. Uh, and you, you're looking for a shirt that fits like a two-year-old. Well, a common question that you might get asked is at, at a brick and mortar store is, well, they can touch and feel the, the shirt, right? But online, they have no idea what the sizing is. And I don't know how this look, works because when I used to shop for children's clothes, it's all based on age, but you know, there's different size kids at any given age. So a common question you might get asked is, will this fit my two-year-old, right? So on your online store, you should make sure like I, I saw this done really well at a store I was shopping at. They literally had pictures of kids and their heights wearing the shirt on every product page to avoid this problem. Which is really good. It, it shows real life example. And the second best thing to that also, or complementary to this, is the uh, to have like the measurements really on. So sometimes the manufacturer will not give that to you, and you need to invest a little bit of time in graphic design to. Just yeah. come up with the, the shirt and then you say what are the size and what's a small, what's a medium, what's a large, and it should fit someone with shoulder of this many inches typically and so on. 
So you, you must have the person to make a, a purchasing decision online with all the, the data that they need. But even measurements are no good because like, do you have a ruler on you at all times? Like th this site yeah. did it really well. They had pictures of different body types of kids, like which, tall, skinny. Which is awesome. Which yeah. is awesome. Yeah. It's, it's way amazing. better. It's way better. Yeah. Like measurements is the basic thing. It's the first level, but you can upgrade to what you just said. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, is that you might be used to being able to talk to your customer in person in a brick and mortar store, but online you have to be the one who is proactively giving out the information that a customer might be looking for because they can't touch and feel the product. Right. I've seen some merchants sort of dump their inventory online, let's say 40,000 products or something like that. And it's not necessarily being very high quality listing. I'm curious mm -hmm. to have your opinion on that. Yeah. I assuming that they're running both a brick and mortar store and an online store or just well, transitioning. Let's say that they, they want to keep the brick and mortar and they want to expand okay. their business with online. So I'm always of the philosophy that you should, whatever you do, like no matter what it is, online or brick and mortar, you should do a good job of it, right? So I would definitely not just dump 40,000 products on there. What I would do is I would probably pick my best, highest margin products at first and do a really good job on the listing, all the things that we just talked about in terms of the value propositions and list those in a special category and then just kind of gradually expand. If you dump, you might think that dumping 40,000 products is the right thing to do because you might attract search engine traffic or whatever, but what will end up happening is no one's going to be able to find anything yep. online. Yeah. And, and, or and or you, even if they yeah. do find, will they buy from you if your competitor did a great job at the listing and let's say he specified the, the voltage and, and the amps or whatever in an electrical product or something, and you don't give that specification if you're not sure what you're buying you're not going to buy it. You're going to buy it from the website that specified that this is compatible. It's not going to Correct. blow up when I plug it in the wall, you know? Yes. So uh, I, I agree with you on this. It should be quality listing, quality over quantity in, in this approach. And, and how you organize the products really matters as well. Like I can't even imagine 40,000 products. Like that just blows my mind how you would even organize that because people get paralyzed by too many choices. I mean, this happens at a brick and mortar store as well, right? So you want to help do their job for them. And, and tell them what to buy. Like we have customers, so we sell uh, linens for weddings, right? And people will often call us up on the phone and and I've answered a couple of these calls from like clueless guys who need to buy a gift for their, for their wife or something like that. And they just like, just tell me what to buy. Like, I don't even care, just tell me what to get. And so I just steer them over to our highest margin products that sell really well. But the same <laughs> goes, right? Just imagine like you're clueless like most, most, a lot of people who shop online are kind of clueless when they're just doing the research part, right? So you should, you need to point out what they should buy. And, and 40,000 products is just oh, like, can you imagine sorting through all those products? You, you'll have analysis paralysis. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's a different type of business, but I do believe it's generally speaking a mistake unless they have a different strategy that they just want to have some kind of an online catalog that will support an offline sales force or something like that. Those are different strategies and goals, but if the goal is really online transactional revenue growth, it's the wrong approach. Quality yeah. should be their way. So. Not to mention that, it, and I, I'm not affiliated with Mage Montreal at all, but like if you're on Magento and you have 40,000 products, that's going to bog your site down too. <laughs> you're you're going to need technical help for sure. You're going to need technical whatever. help. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> Magento in general, you need a you need a programmer. Like the, the, even Adobe is moving the platform in that direction. They remove, let's say, the ability for a merchant to do upgrades or add plugins themselves. You need to do it through uh, you know the version control software and command line and stuff like that. So, so they're they're gearing it more and more toward the higher end market, mid size and enterprise size uh, companies. Yeah. Uh, the other challenge for moving from brick and mortar to online also is just the way you get customers in the door. Like typically when you're in a brick and mortar store, it's all about location, right? Where is the foot traffic coming in and that sort of thing? I mean, branding and stuff is important, but location plays a huge part of it because people have to physically drive there. In the online world, you have to really do a good job of figuring out what your value props are and being able to convey that to a customer when you advertise, right? I mean, in the beginning, there's, there's different avenues. I, I don't know where you want to go with this, uh, uh, Guillaume. Let us explore anything that comes to mind and because okay. it's all useful and it's going to help somebody somewhere in the, in the world, you know? There's a number of different ways to get traffic. Uh, and I'm just thinking about the traffic sources for my store. There's, there's social media, 
there's SEO, uh, there's just word of mouth. Word of mouth is, is, I guess, straightforward. And then there's paid advertising. Now, if you're brand new and you just launched your online store, you're not going to be ranking in search. You might have word of mouth since you're coming from a brick and mortar store. Uh, so, but generally, like paid ads is like the best way to just kind of jumpstart your store. And depending on what you sell, uh, the, the two most popular ad platforms are Google and Facebook. Um, if your products, if people are actively searching for your products and your search terms aren't that competitive, then Google can be a great way to advertise your store. In fact, if you're going the Google route, I would start with Google Shopping. Uh, for our store, at least, and many of the students in my course, it is the highest converting ad for them because you get to see a, well, one, they type in a search, which already has search intent. They get to see a picture as well as the price. So if they're clicking on your ad, there is a high probability that they're in the market to buy whatever product that you have. Um, that's why Google ads work so well. But they don't work so well if no one's searching for your product. Like, let's say you invented something that no one else knows about. Google ads is not a good option for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I was going to just say also that the amount of traffic and sales that you can get from Google is limited by the number of people typing in that search term in Google search. So it's high converting traffic, but the traffic, there's a, there's a, it's basic, there's a ceiling. On how much yeah, traffic? Yeah, exactly. Which is a very good point. Like, uh, and, and each keyword that you target, like, so sort of fundamental. That's important because we're covering fundamentals here. And and if you succeed or fail very often in that transition, it will be because of a fundamental mistake. Uh, you, you need to get the foundation right to, to build this thing. Um, so, and what how what do you think about Facebook traffic these days? Uh, Facebook. So at the time of this recording, iOS fourteen has been out, and it's basically hurt the reporting. But I'm actually of the belief that, well, there, there's other ways. I don't want to get in the weeds on that, but there's other ways to attribute sales to Facebook. Just, but irregardless of that, like Facebook is a great way to reach a large group of customers. But the problem with Facebook is that your creative is extremely important. Like a great creative can drive sales uh, no matter what. And, it, and, and the type of product that you want to advertise on Facebook, and again, it depends on the type of product. When people are on Facebook or Instagram, they're catching up with friends, looking at cat videos and that sort of thing. So you have to interrupt them and give, show them something enticing to make them actually want to click. So if you sell something boring, like office supplies, it might be hard to create that excitement for a click, right? Sure. So Facebook ads are good if you have like a really good value proposition. I'll give you an example. I almost never buy from Facebook. Like I personally, but I saw this ad for a portable pull-up bar that you could take on vacation. Cause I do a lot of pull-ups. I just like pull-ups. Yeah. Like if I don't do them for a couple of days, I feel weird. But whenever I go on vacation, sometimes I can't locate a pull-up bar. And there was this video that literally had all my problems in that video ad. It said, Hey, do you love doing pull-ups when you travel, but you can't find a pull-up bar? We had the solution for you, and it showed a picture of this really cool device, and I bought it on the spot. Uh, you, you put it in the door frame or something? You put it in the door frame. That's correct. Mm, okay. And it's portable. It like, fits in the, in the suitcase. Really cool. Yeah. Okay. So, again, I mean, those are your two options there. Uh, maybe we're even jumping ahead of ourselves, right? Like, before you even run any ads, you have to make sure that your website is in order. Um, I can't tell you how many stores that I've, so I, so I run a class and sometimes people come in with a store already and they're like, Hey, this online stuff isn't working. You know, like, uh, how am I going to get sales? I've driven traffic. I paid for traffic and it's just not converting. And then I look at the site and it's literally just the listing of products. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about some of these concepts already, but as soon as someone lands on your site, it's not like, a, it's not like a brick and mortar store. You have to tell them exactly what you sell and why they should buy and what your value propositions are, like front and center. Mm -hmm. uh, the attention span of someone online is super low. I, I can't remember the exact stat. Maybe you know it off the top uh, of your head. I've heard it just goes down each year. A few years back, they were saying like eight seconds. I think now it's down to like three or four or something. Or five. Yeah, I was going to say it's yeah. around three to five seconds. 
Yeah, so it's somewhere around that. You, you really don't have much time. So first of all, your site needs to load fast. And then it has to be clear what you sell. Otherwise, it's just the bad button. And what's that site? I don't get it. And one mistake I've seen people when creating site, it, it's not all about the design. It's about communicating clearly. So you may have a beautiful website that does not communicate clearly and does not convert. And I've seen another site I was extremely uh, surprised when I first saw it, took over that site. It was ugly, incredibly ugly. But it was a solid seven figure a year site already. Mm -hmm. uh, but like how, like what, what's going on here? You know, no Google ads, no whatever. Okay, there was a strong offline presence, which helped with like the word of mouth and knowing of the brand. But their value proposition was, they nailed it. I mean, they really nailed it. It's, you know, I cannot say too much about it, but it, it, was, it was perfect. So when you arrive on the homepage, you understood. And you, if you're the target market, you said yes right away. And, and that was it. So um, you, you mentioned this already. The value proposition has to be clear as much as possible, not just be another me too product. Yeah. I'm trying to, just trying to rack my brain right now for some of the common mistakes I see. Uh, the other one is like too many different things to click on. Like in an ideal world, when you design your website, every single page should have just one goal and that's it. And you should make that goal, like where you want people to click in some like color that really stands out. Like on our site, all the action buttons are hot pink. Like you can't miss them. Okay. Uh, so choosing your colors matters too, right? I mean, if you think about it, you want your action buttons to stand out. And you also want to use a different color to highlight, uh, you know, any deals or where, where you want people to draw their eye and anything else outside of that one target action on that page should fade it kind of like into the background. It should be less emphasized. Totally agree. And yeah, if we're talking common mistakes, here's another one. I've seen a lot of people care too much of putting too much budget into design or the mechanic of the website, building a ton of feature and not keeping enough budget for their marketing and promotion. Like ideally, your promotional budget is bigger than your build budget. Mm -hmm. So, and the bigger it is, the marketing and ads and all that, the better, you know. But of course, people have limits in their finances. But you know, if you have a hundred thousand dollar, don't put a hundred thousand dollar on the website, and then you you're left with no gas to drive the thing, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I I've just seen so many people give up on their on ads because their website isn't ready to go. So. I mean, yes, I, I would invest enough to make sure that it's that it's up to snuff and, and trustworthy. Uh, uh, the other mistake that I see, and we, we kind of talked to this talked about this already. The conversion rate, the average conversion rate, I think across the board is like two percent, which means that you're losing ninety eight percent of your customers every time they come in, on average, right? So in order to run an effective online store, you need to be able to get their info so you can bring them back. Um, this happens all the time. You know that that pull-up bar place. Um, the first time I saw the ad, I actually didn't click on it. It actually the, the second time is when I bought it immediately. The the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I I think I was like in the car. I was probably driving, which is really bad, by the way. You should never drive and, and, and browse Facebook. But <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I put it down, and then I forgot about it. Like I forgot the company. Like I knew I wanted the product, but I forgot the company. This is very common when you're when when people are shopping on your site. So you want to at least be able to grab their email or SMS or something, messenger, push, whatever it is, right? If you don't have that in place, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Totally agreed. Uh, and I've seen you need to give them an incentive typically to care. Why should I give my my email? You just put a subscription box in the footer that says. Uh, enter your email to sign up my newsletter. Well, people say, I don't want one more spam email in my, in my inbox. Like, give me a reason. So typically an incentive, like at least 10%, if possible, 15%, the one-time usage coupon, I've seen that work. Yeah. Uh, especially if the person's already considering to maybe buy from your store. Oh, yeah, I just enter my email and I get 15% off, really? So I see my wife doing it, then so yeah, sure. <laughs> give, give me 15% off. I, I was going to buy. <laughs> so, but, but this way you're, you're allowed to, um, you know, follow up with the, this customer and, and you're going to lose customer at every step of the funnel until the checkout. So you may have people who add the cart, but will not complete the transaction. And very often these people, you don't have their email yet. They have not created an account. So at least if they, they've subscribed to get that coupon, it's one way to, to get them. 
Uh, otherwise, there are more advanced techniques. The person did log in, then you can send them automated email for abandoned cart uh, recovery. So uh, you put the rule after one day, two day, whatever, you send them an email, say, hey, you started to purchase it and finish, and either with a coupon code or, or not to, uh, to finish the transaction. I mean, my philosophy in general is, is what I call like the wear them down policy. So I'll give you an example. Like sometimes I'll sign up for a list, but I don't have the intention to buy right now. So for example, like I'm planning to buy a gift for my wife, but it's not time yet, but I, I just want to remember this store. So I'll enter my email, but oftentimes I'll forget about that store. So when you're running an email list, you want to just be regularly emailing your customer at least once a week, I would say. They might not be ready to buy right now, but once they are, you want them to immediately think about your store. So I, I call it, I mean, I think that's how I got my wife. I just kept asking her out until, <laughs> until she agreed. I mean, it would wear them down over time, right? <laughs> Great story. And now you have family and kids. Wow. Um, so what else is there to talk about that, that common mistakes? Oh, uh, we, we kind of alluded to this already, but uh, once you get that customer, the, the likelihood of getting them back is extremely high. Too many people spend too much money on getting new customers and not focus on their existing ones. Uh, I have a really good story to tell about my store for that. So we, as I mentioned earlier, we sell products in the wedding industry. Now you would think that if you sell products in the wedding industry, you would just make one sale and then you'd be done, right? I mean, the divorce rate is high in the US. I don't know what it is in Canada, <laughs> but the chances of getting a repeat business, you would think be slim. But one day, I just randomly decided to check our repeat business. I think I just listened to a podcast or something. And I was surprised. Our, our repeat business rate is 12%, which is on the low side for a traditional store. But I was shocked to learn that that 12% makes up over 50% of our revenue. Wow. Shocking, right? Wow. And the reason why is because we were attracting all these event planners and wedding planners who were buying from us in bulk and then making purchases for all their clients. Right. So now, because of that piece of data that we just kind of stumbled upon, like you guys should always be looking at your repeat business, is when we find someone that orders an abnormally large amount of product now, we reach out to them and say, hey, we noticed you bought a lot of product. Uh, are you a planner? If so, we'll, we'll give you a dedicated representative. Here's a custom coupon code. Anytime you want to make a purchase, let's let us know what you need. And we'll assign someone to make sure that those products reach that event or wedding in time. And that's how we've established this large customer base that buys from us regularly. Pretty good. So you're moving. This is not a, your typical you say business to consumer. It's almost business to business because you have it's business another to business. Yep. business buying from you in a regular way, but didn't have a way necessarily to identify them because if they're buying for just one wedding, uh, it's the same purchase. The first purchase is the same size as anybody else's wedding. Uh, you know. Yeah. And uh, like all these principles about running a brick and mortar store apply to online, right? I mean, if you were running a brick and mortar store and someone bought like 20X the amount that a typical person would buy, if you're at the register and you're the owner, you'd probably ask, right? Like, why do you need all this stuff? So. Exactly. It's good. Yeah. You get to know your customer and you're doing some segmentation. Okay. I have my regular one-time purchaser and then I have my... my B2B purchaser will do repeat business. And you could even have two newsletter, one separate for, for each of those. Once you're tagged as a B2B, you could have yeah, absolutely. or stuff like that. Those guys. Here's what's funny. Like as soon as people go online, they're like afraid to talk to people in person. Like they kind of hide behind ads or emails or whatever. Like you should you should run your online store like a brick and mortar, ironically. Like pick up the phone. Like when we launch new products, and my wife actually doesn't like when I do this, but if someone abandons their cart, like you can have an abandoned cart email set in place that'll automatically do that for you. But if it's a new product that we just launched, I'll call them and I'll say, hey, uh, we noticed that you attempted checkout but didn't finish the process. And we just wanted your feedback on the product that you had in the cart and why you decided not to buy. And then we said, don't worry. Uh, you know, no matter what, we'll just give you the product for free. But we just would love your feedback. And this is what I learned. So we we launched, this is several years ago now, but we launched uh, aprons 
And uh, it, was, it was the same issue we kind of talked about earlier. We, we target our aprons, like this apron fits age you know, two to six, and then these aprons are from six to 10. And the main objection, and we had the measurements on the site. The main objection was, I don't know if this is gonna fit my daughter, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, we made some adjustments for that, but that piece of information was priceless. And it could only have been obtained by actually talking to them because you know they weren't going to email me. That this particular customer wasn't going to email me that problem. Right. right. And if you send surveys, which you should, it, most people won't reply. Quite frankly. Right. So, so That's you, correct. You're not going to get all the information that you need. So regardless which technique or tactic you use, you need to get to know your customer, get to know their objections, and get to know like why this product is popular or not popular. Uh, I've seen the same uh, kind of approach with, let's say, some people having Facebook groups and then trying to uh, have feedback, like which one is the best design to print on the next shirt or stuff like that. And then people yep. vote. And then you sort of know that you have a winner before you even produce it because people uh, overwhelmingly said that this design was the best one. And, and this way you, you feel more sure when you do your investment of producing that batch uh, that, you know, it's going to be a success. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many little things uh, that when you go online, you just kind of forget about. So that's why it, it's really painful to pick up the phone and call someone cold. Like my wife would never do it. Um, but I just kind of trained myself to, to, do these, <laughs> to do these uncomfortable things. And they work, you know. So yeah. makes a difference. But you can imagine a larger company doing it. it, it and Sometimes we may say, oh, large companies, they have, I don't know what corporate ways and it's not as human, whatever, but they have a lot of system and processes in place, which small business owner, if possible, would benefit to replicate or at least to some degree to sample a little bit. Like they will do customer surveys. They will try to understand better their customers. And mm -hmm. that, that is applicable no matter the size of the business. But right, like absolutely. Once, once we'll be big enough, then we'll question our customers with surveys or we'll ask their inputs. Like you can start doing that right away. You don't need to be a big corporation to put that in your pocket. Absolutely. Yep. Um, yeah, it, it's so many small things. So it's, it's probably more of a an, an addition of a lot of small things that that makes it work more than just like one big thing. Avoiding many traps, doing a lot of things right, building traffic, having a list, being able to to solicit that list regularly. Um, I'd be curious if you if you agree with this also. Uh, you said to solicit them at least once a week for an email. And, and I believe like if anybody gets annoyed by my email, just unsubscribe. I'm not going to sort of hold back from talking Absolutely. a lot to my list. Like just talk a lot with them, try to build rapport. And if they don't like it, they can unsubscribe. You better have like a, a, a smaller core of highly engaged people than a large list that you barely dare to disturb. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's just something that I've come to learn just because I'm cheap. Uh, it costs some money to keep people on a list, right? If if they don't want your emails, because <laughs> yeah, you're paying like for them, right? Like MailChimp and, uh, and Clavio and all that, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, why pay for these people if they're if they're not buying? Or... <laughs> okay, good point. <laughs> not how I learned it. Okay, but yeah, good point indeed. Um, yeah. Okay. So so let's say what else? Like, what about trying to drive traffic to the site with other techniques than the paid ad stuff? Like, what about like forum posts or trying to I don't know. Yeah. Like Facebook group. Like, is it worth your time? Should you do it? How much of it? It, it all just depends on what your niche is. Uh, I just had this really cool person on my podcast recently, 16 year old girl. She sells something really random called, she, she sells opossum pins. Do you know the animal of opossum? Yeah. Okay. Right. You would not think that there are people who just love opossum so much that they're willing to buy all this possum merchandise. Okay. she did not spend any money on advertising what she did is she looked for facebook groups for possum lovers hmm. okay and then she found these groups and i was shocked when she showed them to me like these groups have like tens of like there's one group that had over a hundred thousand members possum lovers amazing wow. right so she went on these groups and then she posted she, she's kind of like an artist and she was going to sell these pins and she just posted a piece of art that just said hey um, I'm thinking about putting this design on some merchandise. What do you think of the design? I know you guys are all possum lovers. I really want your honest opinion. She didn't try to sell anything. And then she got all this feedback, like, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Like I would, someone wrote, I would totally love to buy like a shirt with this on it or like a pin. And then she was like, huh, 
okay. Tell you what, give me like a couple of days and like I'll post like one of these examples up. And then she posted pictures. She's like, hey, what do you think of this? And then people responded, hey, I want to buy that. And then she casually steered them over to her Etsy store where she sold them. And she today makes $1,000 a month. And she's a 16-year-old kid. Which is awesome. Like most kids would, would love that. It's way better than working at McDonald's. I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. And then she did something even smarter. She went up to those people and she thanked each and every person who bought publicly on the group. That stirred up another thread. People oh. were like, oh, what are you thanking them for? And then she, then she started giving away like samples of her next design. Then she, she did what you suggested earlier. She's like, hey, I want your input into my next design. And then people contributed their opinions. She incorporated those in. And because those people made suggestions, they felt psychologically obligated to buy her next design. And I do believe the future is going toward that to have two-way communication instead of one-way communication. That like the big brand, oh, we have designers, we're we're amazing, we're gonna set the trends or something, and we publish this and we don't ask opinion, and like people should buy that because you know it, it's a very different positioning. Now you're having an honest conversation, you're asking for honest feedback, and you're building a, a connection, a rapport with these people. And it's a, it's soft selling and it's validation before you even do the production. Are people interested in this or not? Then some people may be just too nice and say, yes, 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 it's, it's great. But when it comes time to buy, they might not buy. But yep. at least, you know, you're, you're more likely to be on the right track if you ask for feedback and have a two-way conversation. Yep. Sure of that. Yeah. Any other techniques other than advertising that you've seen, say, some of your students or yourself that, that, that work? I mean, here's something that always works. Like, I'm a big believer in word of mouth. Um, it's not easily measurable. but um, let me just give you an example. Like it, it all word of mouth really travels fast when you do something that's kind of out of the ordinary. It doesn't have to be majorly out of the ordinary. Um, here's an example of what we do. Like if someone so much as has any complaint about anything, we just let them keep the product and we give them a refund. With our business also, like we go out of our way. It's like these little things, these little stories that end up blowing up. One time we had someone have a wedding, but it was local to our house. And she needed them like the next day. But at the time, like there's no way we could deliver it next day. Or no, no, sorry. It was the same day. It was the same day. Same day. So what we did is we stitched it out, this handkerchief, and then we drove it over to the venue. What most people don't realize is that when someone has a positive experience, they tell their friends. But when they have a negative experience, they also tell like nine or 10 friends about it too yeah so word of mouth is just this exponential thing like a lot of our customers we always ask a lot of our customers come in through word of mouth also in addition to the advertising yeah and, and it's more difficult because the somebody's angry is very likely to give you a one star and, and post a bad review but for somebody to, to give you that positive glowing review you need to go a little bit out of your way like you've done here that that's exceptional customer service which is really great i mean she told all of her bridesmaids and I think I know at least one of them had purchased from us after the fact when they got married. I mean, it just yeah. kind of snowballs over time. It's like the long game. Yeah, because then you see, oh, my friend had that thing at their wedding and it was fun. And I want to have the same at mine for that element because they, they planned their wedding themselves. Uh, so, this, yeah, interesting long game plan there. And there's some other elements. For example, uh, you know, in, in your own setup, you offer personalization. So you have some degree a defensive wall around your business that if somebody else wants to sell the same product that you're selling they would have to offer personalization so let's say a smaller startup or, or people who's just listing product online just listing anchor chief online it's not nearly as interesting as your offer because you offer personalization so you have a, a differentiation factor uh, you know a labor on it and, and when you receive it with your name on something it, it makes a huge difference uh, at my wedding everybody had uh, their, their glasses with their name on it and everybody nice. wanted to keep it and bring it home and so on because there's their name on it so yeah we do the same thing at the company like everybody has their name on their company mug oh cool you know and, and this way well, well we don't screw up whose mug is which but everybody brings it home and like there's sentimental value just because there's your name on it yep so um it, it's one interesting point that you i'm actually a big believer in high barriers to entry 
like the harder it is for you to do, the harder it is for other people to copy. And so that's why you should you should do things that are harder or more that require more legwork. I totally back that. Uh, at first, be careful to not like uh, try to get more than you can chew. You know, so that that effort that you can go for it or go in steps if you're starting up that do a phrase one that's really functional. Well, for example, I have a client who wants to offer four payment methods. Well, do we really need the extra delays of having four payment methods to launch the website? I mean, your, your first one is perfectly functional to process credit cards. And then we could offer the second and third and the fourth one as a phase two. Uh, so, so when you do this, say a phased approach like this for, for your go live or for your releases, just make sure that whatever you do is done really well but you can remove features and bells and whistles like that and then do a, a, a real phase two. And the other thing that I've noticed is start the phase two right after back to back with phase one. If you leave a gap in between, everybody starts to forget the project, then you get busy on other stuff and then the entrepreneur does the phase two like two years later. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. So uh, we're approaching uh, the top of the hour here and just like shot got some question. Is there anything else that comes to mind that could help a merchant doing transition from, uh, you know, brick and mortar to online? I mean, the best thing I can say is take everything that you learn from the brick and mortar and try to do, do it online. Like, don't forget about the human component. Um, Treat your online store just like your brick and mortar. Like you wouldn't just slap on 40,000 products in your brick and mortar, like in random shelves, right? Everything would be nicely categorized and logical. And you would naturally place items on the shelves in a certain way, such that your best sellers are more prominent. Same exact thing with online. So as long as you translate your experience over, you should do just as well as your brick and mortar store. If not, uh, most likely better. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And I'll, I'll back you on it. And I've seen say, some traditional merchants being a bit intimidated by all they had to learn with the internet marketing. And it's just a huge topic. And you can rely on consultants to, uh, to guide you in a general way. But it is still the same like as you do for brick and mortar. How do you drive uh, traffic to your brick and mortar store? You do ads? Well, guess what? Let's do ads, but for the website. And you can it can help also to treat the website like if you were opening an additional store. It just happened this is a virtual store. But to give it the same level of care, planning, budget, advertising, and so on, and, and take it seriously, and it, it will help to make this a success. Yep. All right, Steve. Well, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. And if people want to uh, find you, how do they do this? Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to find me is to go over to mywifequitterjob.com. Uh, I have a mini course for whether you're a beginner, advanced uh, e-commerce seller. And I also run an annual e-commerce event called the Seller Summit. And in the event that you guys are getting married, I can hook you up with some handkerchiefs over at bumblebeelinens.com, which is my store. Awesome. Well, thank you, Steve. Take care. Thank you.